this is going to be a bit of a story episode, if you will, so the format's going to be a little bit different from usual, and I hope everybody enjoys the ride. In episode 17, when we replaced the front left wheel bearing, we talked about how my girlfriend had been driving the Blazer after her car broke down. I'm not exactly sure of the exact timelines of when she borrowed the Blazer, although it was on several occasions, but in total, she put something like 3,500 miles on it. And while it's never been the most fuel-efficient of vehicles, overall it did serve her well. Despite our attempts, the steering is still a bit loose, but as long as you know that, and you're careful with it, it isn't too bad. The steering stabilizer did all but eliminate the bump steer, which was the real danger concern. Although, on a really windy day, the extremely aerodynamic body of the Blazer does tend to wander around a lot, and gets a bit hairy. But the issue that popped up with the Blazer and kicked off this episode wasn't related to that. In January of this year, she went to leave for work one morning, and the truck wouldn't start. And not for lack of trying, she sat there for at least 15 minutes, cranking and trying every position of the throttle pedal, and it just wasn't working. She ended up getting an Uber to work, and I got a call saying something's wrong with the Blazer. My immediate reaction was because of the cold and too much pedal, maybe it ended up with too much fuel and it was just being very finicky and hard to start. And it was quite cold, with the temperature hanging around 10 degrees Fahrenheit at night and in the early morning. So when I got a chance, I drove over and checked it out. In pursuit, mostly, of some semblance of fuel economy, in a previous episode we rebuilt and installed this Quadrajet carburetor. And it wasn't perfect, it was and still is missing a few pieces, so under hard acceleration there's a bit of a bog. And even with the throttle blades all the way closed, it idles a little bit high. I always assumed that was because the idle air bypasses were too big for this engine setup. But other than those few quirks, the carburetor had behaved pretty well so far, even if it never quite got to that fuel economy goal. If you remember, when we originally swapped a carburetor into this car before it even had a V8, we went with a simple toggle switch to turn the fuel pump on and off. Working off the assumption that it was flooded and there was probably too much gas in there, I tried to start it with my foot all the way to the floor. It kinda coughed and sputtered, but eventually I was able to get it going. And once it was running, I turned the fuel pump back on and didn't notice any weird behavior. And we drove it around for a bit, and it was acting a little bit funny, but I assumed it was just because of the cold. I was also told that the Blazer was actually getting worse fuel economy than usual, although I didn't realize that this was part of the same problem yet. After our test drive with no issues, I was able to shut the truck off and start it a few more times, and I couldn't reproduce the problem anymore. Everything seemed to be working normally. So, assuming that it was a one-time overfueling problem, I just gave my girlfriend some basic directions on how to start it in case this flooding behavior happened again, and went on my way. Only, the next morning, this exact same thing happened again. She tried to leave for work, and the blazer wouldn't start. So, once again, she found a way to get to work, and I got another call. And at this point, I was convinced that there was a real problem to be solved that wasn't just a quirk of the weather. This time, my initial assumption was that it was the well plugs under the carburetor leaking. This isn't exactly an uncommon situation for a Quadrajet carburetor, and this is why we sealed them with JB Weld when we rebuilt it. Instead of just epoxy, some people will drill and tap the well holes and use threaded plugs. Since ours was a later model Quadrajet, which suffers less from that problem, and we had sealed it, I didn't think it would leak, but it certainly wouldn't be impossible, and it would explain the bad gas mileage and the really rich hard starting. Basically, if those well plugs leak, all of the fuel in the carburetor will drip out overnight and sit in your intake manifold. And since the throttle blades are all closed, it would have a hard time evaporating. So it made sense to me that that would be the problem. So I grabbed a filming light, a camera, some basic tools, and hopped in the Silverado to head over. This footage is from the actual drive that day. It was snowing a little bit on and off, and the temperature high for the day was just below freezing. These weather conditions were, let's say, reminiscent of how they were the previous year when I managed to crash the Blazer. So it's safe to say that all the driving that occurred on these nights was very careful. And fortunately, we were able to get back to the Blazer just fine. So that's pretty much all the backstory out of the way, now we can finally take a look at it. And just like I had done the day before, we'll pop open the hood and remove the air cleaner lid to get a better look at things. So there's our Quadrajet, 
in the months since the rebuild, it's picked up a little bit of rust there, but nothing harmful. Now, it turned out to be very hard to film this, but here we're looking down the primary throttle bore, and we can see the primary blades operating normally. So, using our toggle switch on the dash, we'll go ahead and turn on the fuel pump and see what happens. Nobody has tried to start the truck or do anything with it since early in the morning, and it was now about 6 p.m. And unfortunately, it's extremely out of focus, but you can see the fuel level rising and getting ready to overflow. When operating normally, fuel should not be anywhere near this high. And even after turning off the fuel pump, we can see that fuel is draining directly out the nozzles into the intake manifold. And all that fuel down there would certainly make it very hard to start this engine. Generally speaking, on a flooded engine, your best bet is to hold the choke wide open and hold the blades open as far as they go while cranking. The large amount of air and the movement of it can help offset the amount of fuel in the engine, and if the spark plugs aren't too soaked, we'll usually get things going. Though it should be noted if you have a catalytic converter or oxygen sensor, it may be better just to open the blades all the way and let everything evaporate on its own. But also, all that fuel on top of the pistons can end up washing the oil off the cylinder walls and might cause damage, though at cranking speeds, it's fairly unlikely. Just some things to consider since we're not actually trying to start the engine right now. The truck had flooded like this once before after it had sat for a while. Specifically, when we were rebuilding the small block Chevy engine to put back into it. The first time we turned the fuel pump back on with the Edelbrock carburetor reinstalled, fuel just came right out the vent tube. And eventually I realized that the fuel pressure regulator must have become stuck and it was outputting too much pressure. So when I saw this happening again, I figured it was the same cause and the cold weather had somehow got it stuck again. So we'll start our diagnosis by checking the amount of pressure coming out of that fuel pressure regulator. This truck still has the electric TBI fuel pump in the tank. TBI systems normally operate at 9 to 13 psi and the pumps have a deadhead pressure around 20. But most carburetors want pressure below 7 psi, and quadrajets like it even lower, so we have it set somewhere around 4.5 psi. An inline pressure test is usually the most valuable reading, but in this case, an inline reading probably wouldn't give us the number we're looking for since the needle is obviously not sealing. So for this test, we'll take the carburetor out of the equation and just test the fuel pressure coming out of the regulator. What we need to know is if the fuel pressure is too high and that's causing the needle not to seat, or if the fuel pressure is just right and the needle is not seating for some other reason. Since the pressure should be quite low, for this test we just used one of the nozzles from the gauge kit and pushed it into the 3 8 inch fuel line. Then we'll switch on the fuel pump and once we're sure it's not leaking incredibly dangerously, we'll take a reading. And it's... well I don't know if it's good or bad news, but it's right at 4.5 psi on the dot. So it does not appear that we have a problem with the fuel pressure regulator this time. And it means that to some degree, it appears that we'll have to take apart the carburetor. And if we're going to take it apart anyway, I'd like to modify the idle bypass tube so that we can get a more reasonable idle. Also, working on small carburetor parts outside in the cold doesn't seem like a pleasant situation, so we're going to go ahead and unbolt it from the vehicle and take it inside. The first thing we'll do is remove the clip holding on the throttle cable. Then we can unclip the TV cable, loosen up the bolt holding the throttle cable bracket to the intake manifold, and of course we'll also disconnect all of the vacuum hoses. And we'll disconnect the feed wire for the choke. And yes, that snap you heard was that connector breaking. It always seemed pretty weak to me, but in the cold out here it barely took any force at all to break it. So we'll ignore it for now, but we will have to deal with that a little bit later on. And now we'll start removing the carburetor hold down bolts. The Quadrajet uses four of these, two short ones in the back and two long ones in the front. And now that all the bolts are out, we can lift the carburetor free of the engine. We'll push the cable bracket a little bit out of the way and disconnect the PCV hose and we're home free. It's too cold to use tape or deal with this in any other way really, so to keep this closed we'll just set down the paper towel roll on top of it. And finally we can escape the cold to go back inside and sit next to the space heater on the kitchen floor to take this carburetor apart. In order to take off the top air horn cover, the first thing we need to do is knock out the pin for the accelerator pump arm. And of course I've foolishly forgotten to bring pin punches, but this small hex key bit will do the trick. We'll use our automotive yoga to hold the carburetor in place as we tap on the end of the bit handle with a wrench and knock the pin loose. 
Just remember, you do not want to push this pin flush against the carburetor body because it can be a little tough to get it back out of there. Move it just enough to get the arm loose. Next, we'll disconnect the vacuum hose for the choke pull-off. And then the two screws holding on the pull-off itself. We'll also remove the screw holding the choke linkage to the choke flap so that we can disconnect that easily. Then we need to remove the tiny screw on the rod hanger. And we can pull out the hanger and the secondary rods. Then we'll go around and remove all of the air horn screws. There are seven external screws and two inside of the choke flap. Then with some very gentle prying, we can lift up the air horn cover. We have to be really careful here since I don't have any extra carb gaskets. I did bring extra gasket material, but I was not confident in my ability to replicate these main body gaskets. So we'll carefully and slowly lift off the air horn cover with the gasket staying on the body of the carburetor. But we do need to remove that gasket, so we'll work our way around very carefully lifting up a little bit at a time. Then with everything successfully separated, we'll leave the primary rod holder in place and slide the gasket off of it. And we'll give that assembly a very gentle pry and lift it out of the carburetor. And we can also lift out the plastic float bowl insert. So now we have a good view of the float inside the car body. The reason it's flooding has to be in here somewhere. Either the needle is sticking or otherwise not sealing, or the float isn't lifting up properly. And by properly, I mean maybe it literally isn't floating anymore, maybe it's not adjusted correctly or is somehow out of place, or any other thing that's causing it to not put enough pressure on the needle to close off that passage. The initial inspection reveals, well, nothing. Nothing wrong at all. Boy, I was sure hoping it would be something obvious. But the needle and seat are still fairly new, appear to be in good shape, and as far as I can tell, are quite clean. And the float was still moving freely and where it was supposed to be. So for the moment, we'll just keep taking the carburetor apart to look for another cause. We'll lift out the accelerator pump assembly, making sure to get the spring beneath it, then the fuel bowl cup, and dump it back into the body of the carburetor. Then we'll finally remove the air cleaner stud, which we really should have done earlier, but better late than never. We'll soak up and remove as much of the gas as we can so that we're not spraying it all over the floor of my girlfriend's kitchen. And we'll flip the whole thing over so that we can get access to the base plate. Then we need to remove the carburetor to intake manifold gasket and phenolic spacer. Just like the other gasket, we do need this in one piece, so we'll take it off as carefully as possible. And eventually we get it loose with no important material left behind. And now we can get to the three base plate screws, which we'll go ahead and remove. And I'd like to say we removed the base plate gently, but it actually took quite a bit of force. We really don't want to mess up this gasket because we can't even cut one of these, but we do need to get the base plate lifted off. With all the prying, eventually it started to lift and we very carefully worked it off of the carburetor body. Unfortunately, this gasket, arguably the most important one, didn't come off 100% cleanly. A very thin piece of material came off around that body bolt hole on the corner. We'll peel that off of the carburetor body and then clean up the base plate in the same way. Unfortunately, even more of that gasket came off on the base plate side. So we'll do what we can to clean off that thin part of the gasket and hope that when it's all bolted together again it still seals. Realistically, I'm not sure whether it would be better to take off or remove this part of the gasket. But I figured a clean sealing surface would probably be the priority, so we went with that. And for the gasket, the thinking goes the same way. We'll flake off some of that topmost layer in order to get a nice flat sealing surface that uh, will give us our best chances. Here you can see just how thin that layer is. It might just be an anti-stick coating or something, although if it was it obviously didn't do its job all that well. It's probably some sort of sealing layer on top of the fibrous gasket material. And with the loose parts flaked off, we'll just cross our fingers and move on. And here is our cleaned up base plate. Everything here appears just as we left it. This is probably reiterating a little bit from that video when we rebuilt the Quadrajet, but generally speaking you want the transfer slots to be little squares about this exposed when everything is set up and idling. But on our engine it was idling still too high with the throttle blades completely closed, or at least as far as they will close without binding when trying to open them, which meant this was how exposed the transfer slots were. 
And that's an issue for a couple of reasons. Since all the air is going through the idle bypasses, it means there's no way to lower the idle speed any farther. And with the blades fully closed, we're barely pulling air through the idle mixture screws, which means they can't work the way they're supposed to. And then there are those transfer slots, which also can't work the way they're supposed to, so you end up with a bit of a weird bog when transitioning out of idle. So to hopefully correct these things, the reason we took the carburetor this far apart was so that we could mess with these ports. These ports are for the idle air bypass system. Most aftermarket carburetors don't have any system like this, but the Quadrajet does, which is one of the reasons why it's so easy to drop it onto any engine. These ports allow some air to, well, bypass the throttle blades so that they can be closed farther than they otherwise could be. This allowed GM to do more precision fine tuning and make the carburetor an exact fit for the engine it's going on. On aftermarket carburetors, something you'll see to basically produce the same result is drilling holes in the throttle blades. That modification can help you get the throttle blades in a more ideal position if you have a big engine or a large cam that needs a lot of air at idle. And the quadrajet we have here was either set up from the factory for a large engine or somebody has already modified it to fit theirs. And for our modest 355 cubic inches with a quite small cam, we don't need all that air. But with the factory set up, there's no way to adjust the amount of air going through these bypasses, which means that there is too much air for our small engine, which means it idles too high, and we can't precisely control the fuel metering. The main ways to adjust the amount of air that moves through these ports is to drill them out larger, or to insert bushings that restrict the airflow. I've even seen people talk about just putting a piece of welding wire or something similar in there to block some of the flow. What we're going to be doing isn't exactly as precise or controllable as those methods, we're just going to completely block the ports with epoxy. Considering how high the idle already is with the throttle blades completely closed, I don't think this engine needs a ton of air to idle. So hopefully this won't be giving the engine too little air, and we can get the fine control over the throttle blades that we're looking for. What we decided to do was fill the ports from the top of the plate since the openings there are bigger. We'll cover the area around the ports with electrical tape to try to keep everything tidy. There's a lot going on here, and we definitely don't want epoxy anywhere except exactly where we need it. We'll be doing this on both sides since we'll be filling both idle bypass ports. I believe when restrictors are used, they're usually placed into the carburetor body, but here it seemed like it would be easier to do it with just the base plate, so that's where we're at. We're ready to go, and we'll mix up some JB Quick Weld. We need to get this done as quickly as possible so that we can test drive the truck tonight and hopefully it's ready to be driven in the morning. We'll simply use our mixing toothpick to push epoxy into the ports. We want to do this pretty quickly after mixing it since the epoxy is still fairly thin and should flow fully into the ports. Then we'll press it in a bit and let it sit for a minute or two. By now the epoxy is starting to get a little bit thicker but it's still thin enough that it's easy to remove. So we'll peel off our electrical tape mask and clean up the surface. It hasn't been very long at all since we mixed the epoxy, but everything is already starting to set. We'll just use a razor blade to trim the epoxy flush with the surface. And now we'll also pull off the electrical tape from the throttle bores. The JB weld did flow all the way through both ports. So I feel pretty confident saying this idle bypass will not be flowing any air at all. If this ends up being too little air, or for some reason we want to go back on this in the future, I think we could heat this up with a torch and get the JB weld out without too much trouble, maybe even drilling it a little bit on each side to help start that. But I am hopeful this will do the trick for our engine, so for now we'll just move on. And while we're here, just for kicks, we'll apply a little bit more epoxy to the main well plugs. Since there wasn't a lot of clearance there, I may have gotten a little overzealous trimming the epoxy last time, and it kind of broke off on one corner. So this time we'll put a thin layer of our quick weld on top of the whole thing before we put it back together. We still have to make sure we don't make it so thick that the gasket doesn't seal all the way around, but if we tighten everything together relatively quickly, it would squish out of the way if it had to. So once we've laid on the epoxy, we'll let it cure for a few minutes, and then while it's still a little bit malleable, we'll put everything back together. Well, that was the plan until the local wildlife came to investigate. Between the activity and the smell of gas and epoxy, it's a wonder she hadn't come over here earlier. We turned on our defensive force field to try to keep cat hair away from the delicate machinery, but her assault was ruthless. And eventually it 
seemed like she got the memo, so she just stalked in the shadows for the rest of the rebuild. Which is good, since we had to hurry to put this back together before the epoxy started to cure too much. And once we figured out which way to put the gasket on, we laid it down into place and lined up the base plate. We'll line things up very carefully to make sure the epoxy stays exactly where it needs to be and nowhere else. And with the carburetor propped up so the base plate can still sit flat, and everything looking good, we'll tighten in those three base plate screws. It wouldn't be a bad idea to use Loctite on these, but unfortunately I didn't have any on hand. Before reinstalling the carburetor, we'll tighten these a few more times to make sure they're as tight as they're going to get. At least the carburetor to intake manifold gasket covers these screws up, so even if they were to fall out, they wouldn't get chewed up in the engine. And with that together, we can reset our idle screw to set up our throttle plate positions. And we'll do the same with the fast idle screw, just getting a loose, loose approximation of where it needs to be. And now we'll flip the whole thing back over and start reassembling the carburetor. We'll reinstall the fuel well cup, and then the float and needle assembly. The needle and seat appeared clean, but we did our best to clean them up before reinstalling. Since there was no sign of anything else being wrong, I was kind of just hoping that taking it apart, putting it back together, and cleaning that up would fix our flooding issue. The float height was still set where we left it, and it seemed like it was where it was supposed to be. So we'll drop back in the float bowl insert, the accelerator pump assembly, the primary rod piston and hanger assembly, and we reinstalled the air horn gasket. Then we'll hold the choke flap linkage and make sure it aligns properly, and drop the air horn cover into place. We'll reinsert the accelerator pump arm and use a screwdriver to push the pin back in, and then we'll reinsert and tighten all of the air horn screws. Again, it would be nice to Loctite these, especially the two inside the choke flap, but we'll just go ahead and tighten them all down. Ideally, it's probably best to tighten the ones in the center and then go around and crisscross tighten around the perimeter. And pretty soon, it's all back together and all the screws are tight. We'll thread back in and tighten back down the air cleaner stud, reinstall the secondary rods and hanger assembly. This is another screw we need to be tight, but it's very small, so you do have to be careful. And we'll reinstall the two screws holding down the choke pull-off and connect its vacuum hose. Then we'll unscrew the choke link from the flap and reconnect the link bar. And with that tightened down, the carburetor is completely back together, and hopefully we're done. We'll also mess a little bit with the choke adjustment and try to get that set approximately correct. It was 11pm and time to go back outside and brave the cold. In fact, at this point, the temperature outside was around 10 degrees Fahrenheit. So you might say I was trying to hurry. We'll remove our high-tech intake protector, make sure the surface is clean, and drop on the carburetor base gasket and carburetor itself. And we'll thread in one bolt just to hold it in place. Then we'll push the fuel hose back over the barb fitting and lightly tighten down the hose clamp. And it's finally ready to test, so we can switch on the fuel pump. And as soon as it comes on, there's that overflowing again. Yes, it seems we hadn't fixed this problem at all. So we shut it off and let everything just kind of evaporate for a minute. And once again, unhook the fuel hose. And just to be completely sure about the fuel pressure, this time we'll take an inline fuel pressure reading. I had previously put together this Y connector and string of hoses for exactly this reason. So now we have fuel flowing from the pressure regulator into the carburetor, but also to our fuel pressure gauge. Then we'll turn back on the fuel pump. And with the pump on, we're reading about the same as before, 4.5 psi. The problem is, it's still filling all the way up and dumping fuel through the primaries. So, we're still confident that it is a carburetor problem, although we didn't see anything, and certainly didn't fix it. To make matters worse, at this point I had to leave for a bit, and when I came back to it, it was 1 in the morning. So, guess what? We'll take it back off the truck, take it back inside, and take it apart again. But when we went to take it back off, as a reminder of how cold it is, our electric ratchet stopped electric ratcheting. This thing was fully charged, but just because we left it outside, it had gotten so cold that the battery couldn't power the motor anymore. So at least we can use it as a regular ratchet, and we'll take it inside with us to warm up. And back on the kitchen floor, we'll take that top cover back off. So I sat on the floor on my phone and did some more research. And eventually I found a forum post with an interesting bit of information. This user mentioned that this pivot clip can get flattened out and then it won't hold the float where it's supposed to. 
And sure enough, when I took a closer look at that pin, I noticed that it does have a little bit of space between it and the air horn cover when everything is installed. And since the pivot's not tight enough, that means the whole assembly can lift up and unseat the needle. So all I did was take out that pivot and stretch it out a bit. And voila! Once everything is tightened down, it should compress that pivot clip a little bit, and it shouldn't be able to move. This answer sure makes sense to me, and I think it's enough that we'll go out and try it again. I'm not entirely sure why it would only show up as an issue now, but the few things I can think of are all related to the cold. It's possible the cold affected the tip on the needle, causing it to shrink a little bit and or causing the material to not seal. Maybe it's close enough that in warmer weather or once the engine heats up a little bit it seals the way it should, but in the cold with all that cold fuel flowing over it, it's just not sealing. Or maybe it's the pivot itself that contracted. Or the combination of everything and the extreme heat cycles from very hot to very cold was enough to make that spring clip lose the rest of its tension. But whatever the cause may have been, now the pivot is tight and we'll see if it wants to work. So we'll take it back outside to the blazer and test it again. Now it is 2 in the morning and the feels like temperature is 0 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's safe to say that at this point I really want this to work. It's so cold that the battery for the camera light was barely able to keep it lit. And the camera batteries wouldn't even work for 10 minutes at a time. Anybody out there who has to regularly work outside in temperatures like this, man my heart goes out to you. Anyway, we went through and reattached the fuel hose and enough to get this thing going and turned on the fuel pump. You can hear it kind of gurgle as it fills up with fuel, but then the fuel flow stops and it's not flooding. We cycled the pump on and off a few times, but it still held strong. So at this point, there's nothing left to do but finish putting it together. We'll get all four body bolts in place and tighten them down. And since we took it inside with us, the electric ratchet is once again warm enough to ratchet electronically. And we'll go around and tighten down the four hold down bolts in a crisscross pattern. We'll kind of loosely plug in the electric choke, although that connector is broken and it wouldn't stay on there long term. And we'll go and tighten the bolt that holds the throttle cable bracket to the intake manifold. And finally, we'll reconnect the TV and throttle cables. We had already tightened down the hose clamp and hooked up all the vacuum lines, so we were good to go. Now that the base gasket has had some time to compress, we'll go around and torque down the carburetor. We'll tighten the four bolts in a crisscross pattern to 144 inch pounds. So we were ready to try to start the truck, but at this point all of the batteries and all of the electronics had stopped working so we had to run inside and let stuff warm up for about 15 minutes. So we're back in the cold with our light and our camera working, and let's try to start this. The engine had a heck of a time turning over, but it did and it came right to life. I wanted to make sure it would start on the first try so that the car battery didn't die, but the current fast idle is pretty high, so we'll have to do some tuning. But I think we'll let it warm up a bit first, so the poor neighbors will have to deal with the noise. And this might be the thickest cloud of exhaust condensation I have ever seen. And after about a minute of it running, I shut the truck back off and did some tuning. I managed to bring the fast idle down to a more reasonable level and then brought it eventually up to operating temperature doing some driving around local roads. And once it was warm, I was able, for the first time on this engine, to lower the engine idle to a reasonable speed. Unfortunately, there's no footage of this because none of the electronics were working and I probably couldn't have made my frozen fingers press the record button anyway. And that's about where this story ends. I finished up a bit after 3 a.m. and in the morning my girlfriend was able to take the truck to work without any issues. Except, well the fuel economy is still bad because I haven't had the chance to actually tune it past that. But it's worked fine ever since doing our kitchen floor carburetor rebuild. You know, maybe the only reason that carburetor base gasket sealed was all the cat hair. And she was just trying to help.